Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. In our last lesson on 1 John, we examine chapter 2, verse 16. Verses 15 through 17 are a continuation of John's admonishment that's seen in verses 12 through 14, where he lists four categories of Christians. These categories address in general terms the spiritual maturity of those within the church. After admonishing these believers, John gives them a command and then presents the reason this command is so important, and this is seen in verses 15 through 17. Let me read to you these three verses. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. In our last lesson, we concentrated on the three expressions of sin that's common to every person. Every sin that can be committed falls into at least one of these categories. As Solomon told us in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, There's nothing new under the sun. The sins people commit today are the same as those committed of old. The final point of verse 16 is very important where John wrote, Comes not from the Father, but from the world. As I mentioned in our last lesson, this is just another proof that God isn't the author of evil. The fault lies with men and devils. Now let's examine verse 17. When John wrote, The world and its desires pass away, he was striving to bring to our attention the need to live each day with an eternal perspective. This contrasts with those who live for the moment. When we look at the three categories of sin, which are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they all come out of our sinful desire for immediate gratification or what comes out of this temporal life. Some sins produce immediate gratification, while others offer their supposed satisfaction at a future date in this life. The drug addict, alcoholic, and sex addict look for the quick fix. Others work for what they can accomplish or accumulate in the future. Yet both pursuits of the three categories of sin are all focused upon this temporal life. One may obtain gratification in a moment, another twenty years from now as he accumulates wealth, power, and prestige. In the end, what they are laboring for is temporal, since it will not last throughout eternity. Living for temporal gratification comes to us naturally. It's how we think through our sinful nature, and is a byproduct of a non-Christian worldview. Moses, who was a prince of Egypt, was the epitome of a worldly man. He was raised as royalty and given privilege that few people ever experience. He was taught the ways of the world that were necessary for a prince to live in such a privileged position. Yet when he came to understand who he really was, we are told in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Despite his worldly upbringing, enough truth had somehow come into his soul that caused him to forsake his life of privilege, power, and wealth to suffer what at one time he would have considered a disgrace. We are further told in verse 26, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. At what time this expression of spiritual maturity came to define Moses, we aren't told. We know that by the time the Lord confronted him through the burning bush, he was a man defined by eternal rewards. It took much time for this transition to take place, and I would suggest it was the 40 years while he was in the wilderness. This is true for everyone that passionately pursues the Lord. There's this time of transition going from worldliness to Christ-likeness. It's not just that we must see our need of salvation to live for eternity, but we must come to see the infinite value of Christ before we will give up this world to gain the Savior. Everything in the material world seems to have substance until we come to know Christ and learn just how fleeting this life is and all it contains. It appears to have substance when it doesn't and makes that which has real substance to appear as if it's an illusion. It takes faith in Christ to experience the spiritual realities of heaven and where we love the Savior more than anything in this life. We are told in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10, that Abraham was looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. 
We are never told how the Lord initially revealed himself to Abraham so that he forsook the idolatry of his people to serve the Lord who has no image and didn't even reveal his name. In that culture, Abraham would have been accused of being an atheist because the God he served didn't have an image or name. Abraham must have had a radical encounter with God, or he wouldn't have had the motivation to forsake everything he knew to follow the Lord. After his encounter with God, Abraham had enough faith to take his eyes off of this temporal world and the pain it inflicts to fix his eyes on eternal things. This is very radical. I don't doubt that many people thought that Abraham was strange, because he didn't live like them or seek the world and its pleasures. He had tasted of real heavenly joy and peace, and the world faded away as a result. Let me ask a question here, and I think this is very important. Can we even remain true Christians if we don't live with an eternal mindset? I strongly believe that salvation and living with an eternal perspective are inseparable. If we love Christ, then we will stop loving cosmos and what the world has to offer. The love of Christ and the love of the world are hostile to each other. Jesus made it clear that we can't serve Him and the world at the same time. If we truly love Him, then we will want to be with Him. In a beautiful portion of Scripture, we see the heart of a man that is passionately pursuing God. While Job was suffering his agonizing trial, he cried out in chapter 19, verses 25-27, through 27, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end He will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see Him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Job was yearning to go home to be with God, to see God with his own eyes. We see this again in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 14. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. This heavenly country is more real than the material world that will one day pass away. Yet according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, Job, Abraham, and Moses were living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, and they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. New Testament believers have all the promises of heaven freely made available to them, while these Old Testament saints had to wait until Christ's death and resurrection to obtain their fullness. God created us as eternal beings. Though we have a beginning, we will live forever, either in heaven or hell, depending on what we do with Jesus. To live for these few short years on earth to the neglect of eternity is the most foolish thing people can do. Everything God does in this world is with eternity in mind even the creation of the material universe. Everything of this material world is rushing in its consummation that will only be understood and realized in eternity. Though heaven and earth will pass away, what's eternal will continue forever. To not live in light of eternity is to become earthbound, pleasure-driven people. Earthbound people receive in this life the best they will ever experience, and this is the closest to heaven they will ever get. Those who live for Jesus... This is the closest to hell they will ever get. Those who are residents of heaven while living on earth may have trials and suffering, but they will also taste the joys of heaven that await them. Job's longing for heaven through his season of terrible suffering wasn't a desire to escape this world, but was a real longing after God. The suffering experience awakened this desire in him in a greater way. This is what defined Job before he faced the wrath of hell. It's dangerous to live without an eternal perspective. Such people make the prize of life all about personal happiness rather than knowing Christ, and this is actually idolatry. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? The absence of an eternal perspective perverts in our minds the truth about who we are, the purpose of life, and the value of suffering. If our reason for being is all about personal happiness, then suffering and trials are obstacles to this idolatrous prize. We will fail to grasp how God uses suffering as a tool to transform our character so that we can walk as Jesus walked in this world. The more Christ-like we become, the more we will long to be home with Jesus. We will see the difference between Christ and this world and will come to think like Paul who wrote in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, 
for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. When Jesus is the prize we seek after Him, there's no room for complaining then. Our complaining comes out of the false beliefs that happiness is the prize of life, and when we aren't happy, we turn to complaining, blame-shifting, and bitterness. People not only get angry at people for not making them happy or for supposedly taking away their happiness, they also grow angry at God over it. Until we make Jesus the prize of life, we will not understand the disciplines of faith that must be active in those who claim to be Christ's disciples. Take, for instance, prayer. Jesus stated in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, But when you pray. He never taught prayer as an option for a disciple but a mandatory requirement that is expected of them that they should pursue out of love for God and others. Prayerless Christians aren't real Christians, for such a thing is 100% contrary to Christ's teaching on what it means to be one of his followers. The biblical faith is all about relationship with God. It's about God reconciling to himself those who were his enemies. How can people honestly say that they have a relationship with God when they never spend time with him? The more we love the Lord, the more time we will spend with Him. Two people that have nothing in common won't have much to talk about beyond mere formalities. When people have nothing in common with God, then it's understandable why they don't want to have a vibrant life of prayer. They have nothing to say to God because they belong to cosmos and speak the language of this world. The common ground of fellowship between God and man is found in Christ Jesus. This is why Christ's likeness is so important, because it gives us the common ground of authentic fellowship with God. Paul gave us some brilliant insight in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul is speaking about the act of our will, where we make the choice to fix our eyes on Jesus. The alternative is to fix our eyes on cosmos and what the world has to offer. Either response is a choice of the will, and God won't force us to act in one way or another. The Lord offers us all the grace necessary to fix our eyes on His lovely face, but He won't do it for us. We must decide to lay hold of divine grace or reject His gift of mercy. The Apostle gave those words of wisdom while addressing the subject of suffering. In verses 16 and 17 he wrote, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. If life is all about personal happiness, then trials and troubles are terrible obstacles to obtaining our idol of happiness. But if our hope is knowing Christ, then these trials and troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. The trials we go through today will be insignificant a million years from now, that is, if we are in the presence of Jesus. John stated the world and its desires pass away. This is a spiritual fact. Everything is in a dying process, even the cosmos itself. The promise that the man who does the will of God lives forever is also a fact. This promise only belongs to those who are true followers of Jesus. As a pastor and evangelist, I have preached many times out of Revelation chapters 2 and 3. We find in these chapters seven churches that received a personal letter from Jesus. There are five things the Lord wrote to all seven churches. First, each letter was addressed to the angel or messenger of the church, which would be the pastor. This way the message would be conveyed to the congregation. Then we see the phrase, these are the words, or this is the solemn pronouncement. Jesus said this to each church to show the serious nature of what he was saying. Next, Jesus proclaimed to all seven churches, I know you. This is both comforting and terrifying. We will find authentic comfort if we are living and suffering for Jesus. But if we are living for self, we should be terrified because Jesus knows us and there's no escaping the fact that we will give an account to him. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13 states, Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him whom we must give an account. The fourth thing Jesus said to each of the churches is, To him who overcomes. And this is a beautiful conditional promise. If you go through these two chapters and pull out all the good promises the Lord gives his people, it's actually overwhelming. That's why the fifth word Jesus speaks to the seven churches is so important. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. If we take heed to the rebukes the Lord gives us, then we can receive the good promises He longs to give us. As John wrote, the world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. The will of God for all of mankind is that they would do His will and live forever in the wonder of His blessings. This is the infinite benevolent heart of God. What Jesus offered these seven churches are promises that await all those who overcome. Just listen to these promises. To the church of Ephesus, the Lord promised that they would eat from the tree of life, which means that the Lord would give them eternal life if they would endure to the end. Jesus praised the church of Smyrna and promised them a crown of life. He also promised that they wouldn't have to face the great white throne judgment, and that's really good news. To the church of Pergamum, Jesus promised to give them the hidden manna, which is Jesus, the bread of life. They will be consumed by God as they consume him forever in perfect fellowship. He also promised to give them a white stone that refers to the intimate fellowship we will have with Jesus forever. To the church of Thyatira, the Savior promised to give them the morning star. And who's that? Of course, the prize of all prizes. It's Jesus. He will also give them authority, which is all about having eternal purpose. The promise given to the church of Sardis was that they would walk with Jesus, and once again, this is all about fellowship with the Lord. They will also be given a white robe, which speaks of righteousness, purity, and holiness that's necessary for us to walk with Jesus throughout eternity. And the Lord gave Thyatira another promise, that he would never blot their name out of the book of life. This is a declaration about the permanency of our place in heaven, where we will walk with Jesus forever. To the church of Philadelphia, the Lord warned that he was coming soon, so that they would remain faithful and receive the promise of being a pillar in the house of God. This is just another way of speaking of their permanent place in heaven. This is the only biblical expression of eternal security. Then Jesus said he would write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on him my new name. All of this has to do with ownership, that we belong to Jesus and will have a permanent place of fellowship with him. To the compromising, lukewarm church at Laodicea, the Lord promised to those who overcome that they will sit next to him on his throne. Here is a promise of intimate fellowship with God that gives us eternal purpose for our lives. Notice that all these promises overwhelmingly reveal that the prize of eternal life has nothing to do with possessions or mansions, but with belonging to Jesus and knowing the sweet fellowship he promises. Can it be any plainer to us that the word that John declared The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever? What the Lord offers to those who overcome is astounding. Doing the will of God is all about living the victorious Christian life that can only come through loving obedience, whether through suffering or prosperity, by life or by death. Doing the will of God is never a time and chance affair, because it's always a purposeful act of the will. Either we choose to obey the Lord or choose to rebel. Partial obedience is always disobedience. It's the deceptive nature of partial obedience that makes it extremely dangerous. To believe the lie that partial obedience is acceptable to God is to be self-deceived, and this is a damnable lie. This takes us back to what John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3-5. through 5. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. So what is John saying? Those that love God obey him. They are the ones that do the will of God. Therefore, they are the ones that will live forever with Jesus. These truths aren't hard to understand if we have a teachable heart and want to take the word of God at face value. Those that claim to be saved by grace while practicing sin refuse to believe the plain teaching of God's Word. We can't avoid the necessity of obedience to God that's integral to salvation. This isn't salvation by works, but the manifestation of salvation working in a life. The fact that a man can do the will of God tells us that he is dependent upon God to obey his will. This is the true grace of God. The final point I want to make on verse 17 is a word John used that's translated by the King James Version as abideth 
and other translations use continues, remains, or lives. These are all acceptable words to convey the meaning of the Greek word, but I think abide presents a better idea. The word is a primary verb that means to stay in a given place, state, relation, or expectancy. It can mean to abide, continue, dwell, endure, be present, remain, stand, or tarry. There's a permanency that the word gives as John uses it. So words like remain and continue, though accurate, don't present the modern use of the idea of the eternalness that's the reward the Lord offers. To live forever gives the idea. But I like the biblical idea of abide that gives a broader idea of dwelling in Christ forever. Either way, no matter what word you use, the promise is wonderful. The Lord deserves the reward of His suffering, which is to passionately pursue Him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. As we turn our attention to verses 18 and 19, it seems at first glance that John began a whole new train of thought. But a closer look reveals that even though he is beginning a new thought, he is also coming out of the one that he has been addressing in the prior verses. Let me read these verses, and then we will begin digging into them. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Verse 19 is what ties in John's new thought with his prior teaching. So let's begin with verse 19, and then we will come back to verse 18. The points that they went out from us and that they would have remained with us is a continuation of John's thought of our abiding forever with God because we have done the will of God. These two verses are put in contrast to the encouragement John gave to children, young men, and fathers that we see in verses 12-14 through 14 in the closing thought of verse 17. The point is that if we remain in Christ, then we must obey Him, and if we do the will of God, then we will abide in Christ forever. Abiding in Christ in this life will continue throughout eternity. Those who don't abide in Christ in this life won't abide with Him forever. They will be outside of God and His goodness for eternity. The defining point of verse 19 is, they went out from us. I admit, this is a very challenging verse. Those who believe in eternal security use this verse to help support their doctrine. Eternal security is a belief that in this life Christians can't forfeit their salvation. I thoroughly reject this doctrine because I don't see that it's soundly supported in Scripture. There's enough even in John's epistle that goes against the doctrine of eternal security. We must keep this in mind as we strive to understand what the Apostle is teaching. We mustn't take things out of context or out of what the Word of God teaches in other places. I don't deny that verse 19 is hard to teach, but I will do the best I can to be faithful to the Word as a whole and to what John is teaching specifically. The points people use to support eternal security from this verse is, but they did not really belong to us, and for if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, and finally, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. There are actually four points made in this verse, and they must be reconciled to each other to make sense. Otherwise, John's first point will contradict the remaining three points. The four points are, number one, they went out from us. Number two, they did not really belong to us. Number three, if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. And number four, their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Everything hangs upon what it means that they went out from us. There are two ways this can be understood. First, the people that John states are Antichrist in spirit only appeared to be part of the church. The second understands that they were genuinely part of the body of Christ, but didn't endure to the end because they gave themselves over to false doctrine. As we have already seen with John's teaching in this epistle, he was an eyewitness of the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. He was also among the three that comprised Christ's inner circle. So it's understandable that he would use the language of Jesus in many places, which he does. For verse 19, John may have used Christ's language from portions of teaching such as Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 23. Let me read this to you. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. 
Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This teaching warns about false prophets that strive to convert people to their damnable doctrines. One place Paul addresses this point is in Galatians, where he writes about the Judaizers that strove to mingle the Mosaic law with Jesus being Messiah. Some of these false teachers never came to Christ, and that's what it sounds like when Jesus says, I never knew you. But that's not the end of the story. When we come to parables like the ten virgins and the talents that's seen in Matthew 25, we start to see a different picture that sheds much more light on the subject. In the parable of the ten virgins, we must understand that all ten were believers, since they were all pure virgins that were clothed in white. This speaks of their relationship with the bridegroom, that they were pure and holy, undefiled by the world, and were clothed in righteousness. All ten were waiting for the bridegroom, and all ten had lamps, which denotes salvation, and all their lamps contained oil that indicates the life of the Holy Spirit was operating in them. The picture is of ten women that were in right fellowship with God, waiting for the wedding. The fact that five were foolish and five were wise can only be determined by the end result, not by the fact that they were pure and righteous and contained the oil of the Holy Spirit. A change took place where they went from being ready for the bridegroom's coming to not being ready. The foolish virgins didn't give up their pure state, nor did their clothes become filthy rags. They still had their lamp. The problem lies in their running out of oil. They didn't properly prepare for the bridegroom's coming. It was only when the bridegroom was coming in a procession of joy to get his bride that the condition of the virgins was actually seen. Notice that the bridegroom was coming for all ten virgins. That was his plan. Since the foolish virgins ran out of oil, they fled to buy some oil. But while they were out, the bridegroom came and took away those who were ready. The door was shut to the wedding banquet, signifying the finality of the state of the ten virgins. Five were rejoicing within, and five were locked out. When the foolish virgins found that they were locked out, they cried out in verse 11, Sir, sir, open the door for us. But the bridegroom replied in verse 12, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Given the description that Jesus purposely gave us about the ten virgins, it's only reasonable to claim that they all had a right relationship with the bridegroom at one time, for he was coming for them all. Now add to this verse 13 where Jesus said, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. If people in this life can attain a state of eternal security, then what Jesus said in verse 13 is absolutely meaningless. Yet the purpose of this parable was to help people stay ready, to prepare them for eternity and for Christ's soon return. If they have to stay ready, that means that the outcome of the foolish virgins is a reality for any of those who let the oil of the Holy Spirit burn out. Here is the challenge. What did Jesus mean by, I tell you the truth, I don't know you? Well, I'm not going to tell you right now, until our next lesson that is, so I'm going to leave you in suspense with a cliffhanger. So, see you in our next episode. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek him in spirit and in truth. Under the water, and the thirst no more. So come wash in the river. Come drink your fill. Let healing waters bear away your guilt. Lay down your burdens on a beautiful shore. Come wash in the river Come be